what led you to substance abuse? It usually stems from trauma. Well, like, what's that line between recreational drug use? When you're surrounded by addiction and drugs, it's... Uh... Owen, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm really excited about this chat because I know how many people this can potentially help. Yeah, I hope so. I want you to take me back into those early years. What led you to substance abuse? Um, well, like 99% of, you know, addicts out there, it usually stems from trauma and kind of, uh, situational living, right? Like I was on the streets pretty young. Like I got, I left home really early and just kind of got exposed to that stuff at a very young age and, you know, didn't have any guidance or responsibilities or, you know, anybody to really kind of show me a, a a path to positive path like i you know dropped out of high school in grade nine and then i was over here in vancouver just across the country from any family all alone 15 years old and uh you know had just some family family situations that kind of put me into a pretty i would say kind of a rough situation and uh you know coping with trauma and coping with those feelings is drugs are a godsend for that kind of thing, unfortunately. And, you know, that's kind of where it all began in those early years is, you know, obviously as a teen kind of coping with uh, feelings to, as a teen to begin with is hard, let alone when you're surrounded by addiction and drugs, it's, uh, it makes things quite a bit harder to put yourself on the correct path. You don't have the same kind of guidance. Your story is wild for so many reasons. Um, but one of them that strikes me is just how early all this started to happen. Like you're leaving home at 15. The first time you get into recovery and actually get clean, you're 18. Like you're still basically just a baby, just about to become an adult, depending on what legal jurisdiction someone's in. Then you have this career as a pro skateboarder, which is plagued by injuries. And that's your kind of catalyst for going back to drugs again is that correct yeah well like so i went into treatment around 18 and that was just for heroin addiction um so i was using heroin throughout my teens and i got clean from heroin although skateboarding back then was you know you worked your ass off for about six months came up with a video part and then you know you didn't have the same kind of following that you do now where everybody's looking at everything you do so there's a big huge party scene because we'd go through you know different cities to demos and stuff like that so you know the partying was there with like the you know alcohol and cocaine and stuff like that and then when the injuries come in that's where the, all the opiates start to come in as well and for me at that point it's in my life it was anything really that i could get my hands on was alcohol drugs um you know prescription medication from the injuries and then yeah so it was just kind of it set me back onto that path like although i didn't use heroin for a long time i still ended up using a lot of other things well like what's that line between recreational drug use like you're a pro skateboarder and you're kind of living this party lifestyle so many people can compartmentalize that party lifestyle they can party but then they can they don't transition from party people to addicts what separates someone that takes cocaine and then transitions to opioid-based drugs and develops a real problem with it from other people who can take it, use it, and then put it away? Um, I think like I'd, I've gone through quite a bit of treatment and, you know, I've, I've uh, got quite a bit of experience in like kind of the neuroscientology of it and Scientology, but the neuroscience of it all is kind of, um, it's a little bit of a different brain chemistry in addicts. So, you know, like when I would go out with my skateboarding friends, they would go to the, we would all go to the bar. They could, you know, get hammered to have fun, go home and be fine. I'd be disappearing to go find drugs. And, um, it was just, it's big in the brain chemistry. It just kind of works a little bit differently. And I think that that had stemmed from, you know, people that connect to it through the trauma in their lives and the brain chemistry is kind of those neural pathways are a little bit different for addicts as opposed to normal in quote normal people so you know it's just um it takes a bit of a hold differently with uh, the brain chemistry and addicts as opposed to just the uh 
the recreational users because yeah i've seen some people be able to put it down and pick it up just fine and then others just they can't even put it down once they pick it up so you know like um i have seen a lot of that information come through in treatment and yeah there's a lot of neuroscience to it but uh i think that it's just a little bit of a different brain chemistry for the people that uh can't put it down when you're in the grips of that addiction i have friends who have been addicted and you know they'd still describe themselves as addicts even though they're clean but can you help me and help the listeners what's the feeling when you're addicted is there do you have a vision for the future or are you very much living day to day act to act and just have no way out well that's the the only vision for the future that comes in addiction is the fear of getting sick without it. Um, so you're constantly battling to avoid that dope sickness, we call it. Um, so there's no, it's a truly a day-to-day -day grind, um, hour to hour grind. And the only time I could look into the future was, oh no, I'm gonna be sick in tomorrow morning if I don't have this. So. The farthest I would ever look into the future was the next morning if I didn't have my drugs, and I'd be really sick. So, like as far as looking into the future, how, how do you go about funding it? It's a lot of like, is it all like, is it a mix of criminality and you know sideline incomes or like? Yeah, it's. I suppose I'm trying to just get an insight into what that world is like, the day to day. What do you do when you wake up in the morning, and how does your yeah? How do you go about your day? See, it's changed a lot now. Is um, like. You know, sometimes I could hold the job, sometimes I couldn't. Um, but addiction, it's progressive. So it's just only going to get worse and worse and worse. So some people were able to hold the job for X amount of time, and the addiction will just completely progress and progress where you can't hold a job at all. Um, and then, yeah, petty crime. Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, you know, have some companies that I work with through my through skateboarding that I was able to kind of get some commissions on screen printing and merchandising. Um, so I still had a little bit of income in that way. Um, some people as well as, you know, the government with uh, welfare is probably, you know, that's not going to get people anywhere, you know, that pays for their food and shelter, but the food portion, they just blow on a day on drugs. And so, yeah, there's just petty crime, selling drugs and, you know, shoplifting from the big box stores kind of stuff is mo mainly what most addicts kind of how, how they fund their habit. And when you get to that point, that mindset where you're like, OK, look, enough's enough. This is only ending one of two ways. Either I get clean or I die. Mm -hmm. When you get to that point, what's the first step for starting to dig out of the black hole? Um. It's really hard because for myself, it's like it took me about five years of trying really hard to finally get clean. And yeah, you, like you, you get to the point like for me, it was I was at the point where I was either going to be dead, you know, or spend years in prison or, you know, get clean and get clean was um, for a lot of athletes. Uh, like for a lot of addicts that's kind of the lower tier one that seems the m least realistic unfortunately even though it's the highest in the hope right like the hopes is to get clean but in the reality it seems like it's the least the thing that's going to happen so you know like it's just a matter of finding the right community and like so so the first steps is usually just go to detox um and either some people quit cold turkey or they take, um, you know, some medication to help wean off the drugs like methadone or something like that. Um, and then just finding the right treatment center or the right community, um, you know, and the right support is probably key. And sometimes it just takes a while to finally get that perfect kind of um, recipe, I guess, of community support um and just the where you're at in life and you know some people just try and try and try and sometimes it's just that one time that just seems to hit perfectly and but i see i'm not in any way comparing the two but i was taking about 1200 milligrams of caffeine a day and i was like okay that's enough i need to get off caffeine 
And I, when I went to get off it, I actually couldn't believe the chemical hold the caffeine had over me. For four days, I was terrible mood swings, violent headaches, fatigue, and every fiber of your body is just telling you, just have a coffee and it's all better. Yeah. Just have a coffee and it's all better. Yeah. And that's with caffeine, something as benign as caffeine. Yeah. Like, what's that withdrawal like from something as toxic as opioids? Oh, it's it's hell. Like, it's, you know, like, people always used to say is, like, you know, don't ever try heroin because you'll love it. And it's because <laughs> that high is so perfect for someone maybe that just has that need to kind of escape the everything and so you look at the other end of the spectrum and that withdrawal is just hell you know it is probably the worst physical sickness that i've ever experienced in my life um and so that's where that fear of you know getting clean is that a lot of people are like they just fear that and you know some people can get seizures and you know it can get really bad but, you know, like you said before, is the other under the spectrum is either, you know, jail or death, right? And so there are medications that people can take, like, that help that process, that help that withdrawal. And um, it definitely does help. Um, and it helps stabilize a little bit and takes away a little bit of that uh, withdrawal symptoms that you know, most addicts fear so much. For a long time, your story was the story of a large chunk of addicts, that they have some sort of trauma, some sort of avoidance, some difficult economic family situations or social situations, which led them to drugs and led them to a life of poverty and, you know, just this desperation that you've described. We're seeing a wave in the last 10 years of a totally different type of drug user. And it's one that, I had a small little foray into it. When I broke a shoulder in a crash in a criterium out in the US, the doctor prescribed me OxyContin after the crash. And the power of those pills, I've never experienced a chemical pull like that in my life. And I knew after like three days of taking things, I was like, these are going to get me. Like I'm not strong enough to withhold. Like my, my willpower is just not strong enough to keep me away from these. And I had to just get off them like right then. Talk to me about how big a problem OxyContin are, and have you seen this sort of tier, second tier of addicts emerging now as a result of that use? Yeah, um, and yeah, I see it. I saw a ton of it when I was in treatment. Like I went through, you know, various treatment centers, and I saw a ton of it there with, uh, you know, pro football players, pro hockey players, a lot of hockey players because you know it's Canada. <laughs> um, but yeah, they would have it, you know, an injury. And the doctor would prescribe them morphine and then Oxycontin. And, you know, with Oxycontins, the doctors were giving them out like candy because I think they didn't know exactly the extent of how bad those were. Um, and then they could just, they would just cut them off cold turkey. And so a lot of these guys didn't have any other resource other than to go to the streets and get street drugs to compensate for, you know, their withdrawals and, you know, to continue the pain relief, right? So they're still in physical pain and, you know, mental pain because now they've lost their career and there's depression there. And like I was saying before about, you know, the uh, neurochemistry in their brain, like, you know, maybe they're just more susceptible to to that connection with addiction than most other people. So, yeah, I saw plenty of that in treatment where, you know, pro athletes would, you know, have one injury and it just took them down such a dark path. Have you watched Dope Sick? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's a, a very, very good example. You know, just the bottom line. Mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, those kind of shows, they're, they're intense, but I think it's also just shows how, it can take just such a hardworking day-to-day person and take them from their job, from their family to the streets and to just the hell that addiction has and can put on a person 
can take it just that's the thing about addiction is it doesn't discriminate right like it can take anyone at any time and that's the scary part and i think that that show is kind of a good example of that as well at what point did you recover or, sorry at what point did you discover cycling and how big a catalyst was that in your recovery um well to be honest, like cycling has always kind of been like, I come from a family of professional athletes. So my dad was a pro hockey player. My sister, she's an Olympian. Like she's incredible. Like, I don't know how she did it. She went through kind of the same type of, uh, you know, the same kind of thing. And she managed to just become a professional runner. She did so well for herself. So I'm super proud of her for that. And so I came from, a family of professional athletes. My uncle was a, you know, pro and cyclist in Europe. And, you know, my cousin was in the world tour as well. And so I think cycling was, I was aware of it, but I wasn't aware of the extent of it until I was in detox with a gentleman that owned a bike shop. And I was lucky enough to be able to get a bike from him. And, you know, we would sit around in the treatment center and watch Tour de France and go for rides and stuff like that. And, <laughs> you know, like coming from, you know, a genetically, I think, a pretty adept family into endurance athletics, it kind of came pretty naturally. So um, when I discovered it, it just, it changed everything, you know, like it kind of substituted um, skateboarding perfectly because you know all skateboarding is is so much time and energy in the same kind of way cycling has too so you know you can go out there with friends or you can go out there solo and just put the time and the effort in and that's kind of what I was doing at that time was just going out for long rides all day every day and I treated it somewhat to skateboarding it was like you know if you get better you got to get better you got to put in tons of time and tons of effort and yeah so I kind of saw the true side of cycling like kind of learned how team tactics were kind of learned saw more the racing side of cycling as opposed to you know what i grew up with with my family and what's interesting with cycling the structure of it in competitive cycling at least it's it's built the architecture is built in such a way that there's such a perfect feedback loop when you put in more effort you get better results they're rewarded with points and then you cut up so you start off cut four you put in some effort now you're a cat three, you put in some more effort, now you're a cat two, you put in some more effort, now you're a cat one. It's really incentivized to keep you progressing, which has got to be so helpful for right. staying clean. Well, and that's kind of like where I first really saw the growth in how cycling was working for me so well, not just in recovery, but just in finding a substitute a for skateboarding and like you know i feel like i've always been a pretty athletic person throughout my whole life like you know athletics was pushed on us so much as growing up coming from professional athletes you know and so when i found cycling and you know i went into my first race and i think i i had no idea how to race i just went out there from the gun and just rode as hard as i could didn't know what the hell i was doing ended up winning by like three minutes and i was like oh okay this is fun and then i had some friends that kind of were like oh well this is how it works like you know this is kind of how the categories work this is what the teams are this is blah blah and i always i didn't have a team for quite a while the first year or so but that's where i saw that growth was i would go from cat four and then you know i went up to cat three to cat two cat one and that's where that growth was really kind of validating for me that I had chosen the right path. For a long time though, when you got to cat one, we had this ceiling in cycling where it's like, all right, maybe you can get to continental level, but you kind of hit this ceiling in cycle where there's a little bit of a sense of, okay, what's next now? Because, you know, most people don't have what your cousin has like Alexi and have a chance to go to the world tour. So you hit this ceiling and all of a sudden that feedback loop is broken and that can be really difficult. And I've seen a lot of people struggling with that when they get to cat one and they're like, uh Oh, everyone's talented. Everyone trains, everyone knows how to use a parameter. Now I don't have this feedback loop, which I relied on so much, but gravel has become such a good outlet for cat one riders to move across into something slightly different. Now we're not comparing our old experiences. We're not saying like, Oh, I went to this race two years ago and I got second. Now I went to it this year and I got fourth. So that feels like a step back. Mm -hmm. 
instead now we're going into gravel and we're getting to experience amazing things like you went to the trans cortegers if i pronounce that right yep. like the eight day stage race in colombia that's just must have been such an amazing experience to do something novel and new and again more growth yeah for sure well yeah like you said you kind of get to that ceiling so in 2019 you know like i'm i'm getting older and it's like the i'm racing against these guys that just have the that top end that can do that over and over again. And I can't anymore, you know, like I didn't have that same top end and, you know, on the road racing scene here, it was like, you know, you wanted to get into a strong team, then you needed to kind of, they needed to see that growth. Otherwise you're just going to be stuck as a domestique and, you know, and you got to find the right team. So there wasn't really that there for me so much anymore. And so I started really taking gravel seriously around 2019 and yeah, it's just, it's the experiences there are amazing because yeah now all of a sudden everything's changed is that the opportunities change that you don't have the same kind of team tactics you don't have the same kind of team responsibilities everybody can kind of go for themselves and whether they just want to ride to complete the event or whether they want to race hard and go for a podium and you've got so many aspects of of people and so many you know it doesn't have the categories right so you've got just that experience from every person experience it in their own way and you know the way that gravel is racing now at least in my experience is that kind of is like the road for the first you know two three hours it's like you know every guy's just trying to fight for the breakaway and then they're in the breakaway and then they hit a technical section and then it's fighting for the breakaway and then staying in the breakaway again and so you know you kind of do get when you're stuck in you can kind of get that road racing feel um, at certain events but then like yeah there's the events like trans cordageras where it's just it's a life-changing event right you're just crossing the andes for eight days and <laughs> accomplishing it is you know people are there just to accomplish let alone try to get some results and yeah it's just it's life-changing and you don't need you don't need a power meter you don't need a team you know you you don't need the you know, 1200 watt repeatability like you would on the road. <laughs> so what, what did you think of Columbia? Oh, it's beautiful. I love it there. The people are amazing. You know, they're so welcoming. Um, the racing's hard. Everybody's fast. Most beautiful girls you've ever seen in your life. I spent some time in Medellin and I was like, yeah. I can't believe what I'm saying. It's Shakira everywhere I look. Yeah. And Medellin, it's, it's gotten to be like quite, a cultural place where there's so many people from all over you know like i was sitting at a cafe i've got dutch guys here there's guys from you know brazil and then there's you know another set of guys from the us and so you know it's really kind of become a tourist mecca more so now which i think is really good for the country because you know it had that stigma for so long about cartels and whatnot and i don't i felt so safe down there and you know the people are amazing and yeah like you said everybody's just everybody's fit and good looking and you know active and yeah it's a great place i love it so much it's beautiful there you know as well the more people i talk to on the podcast about what makes us happy and live a long time so many people are coming back with community connection friendship and I've been reflecting on this lately because I went, turned 40 uh, last month. And, you know, it's one of those milestone birthdays. Yeah. And yeah. at 40, something weird's kind of happened where you have a group of friends that you were friends as a kid and you're still friends with them. But you've all kind of gone off and people are raising families, they're in relationships, but everyone has different interests. And really, so your new friend group, if you're in any way busy, becomes not really your old friends, but people who you share an interest with. And yeah. when you're 40 years old, it's very difficult to make new friends. Mm -hmm. Like you can't go up to somebody in a coffee shop. If I see you in a coffee shop and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You want to be my friend? You're like, well, this is weird. Like, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> but at a bike race, it's so different. It erodes these barriers. And all of a sudden you yeah. can go to a race like this, meet another dude your age. And you're like, hold on, I've just made like it's like the scene out of uh, one of the Will Ferrell movies, Step Brother. He's like, yeah. hey, do we just become best friends? It's yeah. like. Yeah. it's so amazing yeah it really is and that's like that's what i love about the 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 gravel racing more so than like at least from what i experienced on the road 
you know, like when I used to go to the road races, like here we had uh, a series called the Spring Series back in the day, and it's still around now, not really kind of the same as it was then. And it was a big block of racing throughout the spring. And, you know, guys would just kind of go, say, hey, keep to themselves more so, race hard, then drive home. Right. And at it's the, rootless. Yeah. And at gravel events, it's like now it's like I go to these big events around the U.S. and, you know, you see all your friends and you get to hang out afterwards and you feel like you've actually spent time with them as opposed to like you've just raced with them. Right. Like you feel like you've actually experienced and spent time and hung out. And, you know, like as you were saying, it's like I've got a very good friend and I think we've spent we've gone for dinner once. And all of our time together has spent on the bike, but we're super close <laughs> and it's, but we've never really spent any time off the bike, but we feel, you know, like we are really good friends and it just goes to show like, yeah, that community is, I think for myself, it's, it's really what's kind of kept me wanting to get better and wanting to go to these events and wanting to experience more is because of the people. You know, you get such great people, such amazing athletes, professional, non-professional, and you're all there just to have a good time and, you know, perform well, not perform well. Everybody goes for a beer afterwards and yeah, it's the community. Did you struggle with, did you struggle with, uh, for want of a better expression, coming out, like letting the cycling community know about your past, mm. speaking about your troubles with addiction? Yeah, I kept it hidden for a long time. Um, I didn't really want anybody to know. Um, I just wanted to be another bike racer, right? Like, at least here on the road. Um, I didn't, I think it's not that it, the, the scene here was pretentious. I think I kind of viewed it as clicky. And I was like, so, you know, like I was in and out of teams and I was on some good teams. But when I first got into it, I rode solo all the time. So, you know, I'd go into the races just dressed in black, go race, go home. And just wanted to be a bike racer. Just wanted to try to be as good as everyone else and, you know, have fun. What did you find intimidating about coming out to your peers? Was it uh, the cycling traditionally, I suppose, has quite a affluent socioeconomic class it's middle class to upper middle class and you know some of the professions and yeah. stuff was it the fact that you're coming with a totally different life experience and just didn't feel like they'd understand those problems yeah i think and especially in north america i think that uh you know like i think it's different when i've witnessed that in colombia but in north america it definitely cycling to be you know, a, a professional cyclist. So you did, a lot of them do come from aff affluent families or have kind of a benefactor that helps them. So what what's the intimidating aspect of letting your peers know that you do have this history? Is it them coming from a very different socioeconomic class than you are and just not identifying with those, that life journey that you've had? Or is it something different? Yeah, I think like um, it is definitely... For number one, I think it's the stigma that, you know, addiction has, um, you know, like there's always been mental health and addiction kind of has a stigma surrounding it, um, you know, and yeah, so I always kind of felt intimidated just because a lot of these people did come from affluent families and, you know, cycling in North America to be a professional cyclist, you either have to have a benefactor or come from a fairly wealthy family. Um, and yeah, I just kind of felt like I was um, intimidated a little bit by that lifestyle versus my lifestyle. And maybe just there's that kind of inherent shame that comes with addiction. And that is mine, not anyone else's. So, you know, everyone I've ever told and been open with has been 100% supportive and great. I've never had any negative feedback. So the fear has always kind of been within myself more than anyone else so it was intimidating just um like you said through different class and you know just there's so much stigma that surrounds addiction nowadays which is something that i'm hopefully trying to kind of de helps destigmatize so people can be more open and get the help do you still feel it or have you moved past it 
or do you care what people think? Yeah, I think <laughs> that's the main thing. I think now I don't, I think all we kind of want to do is try to help, right? I, I want my story to maybe potentially help at least one or two people. And if that, that's more rewarding to me than whatever anyone may think. Like, I really don't care. Like if someone wants to judge me for my past and for, you know, what I've gone through in my life, then that's on them. I'm being open about my past so I can potentially help someone else. And the way that addiction is taking lives now at the rate that it's people are dying, it's me trying to save a life more so than, you know, just trying to help someone with my experience. I think we're always so worked up about other people's perception of us. But in my experience, and this is something that's evolved as I've aged, and maybe it's this post 40 wisdom, people are so caught up in their own shit. They just don't care about our backstory. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was the big thing too, was just like, I had to say to myself, I'm like, oh, and no one's really going to give a shit. Like, you know, you are who you are now. <laughs> like, don't worry so much about it. And that's kind of what motivated me a little bit more. It was just like, I know my mentality. It's like for the people that make the choices that they make, I don't discriminate or I don't, you know, it's, that's their choices. I am not in any position whatsoever to judge them on any, anything. So if 99% of the people have the same mentality I do, they're not going to care. <laughs> And I think we're getting better as a society as well at instead of seeing people and stepping over them on the street, if you see someone on a sidewalk and looking at them as bad people, mm -hmm. realizing that the the veil between me and them is quite narrow. One or two life choices and fate could have me on that sidewalk with someone else stepping over. So you start to view them not as bad people, but as sick people, yep. people that have had unfortunate circumstances yep. and they're going through a transient experience which hopefully they come out the far side of mm -hmm. that's happening slowly not as fast as i would like and i'm sure as hell not as fast as i'd say you would yeah. like but i do feel it is changing a little bit yeah it is changing a lot because i think that the um, awareness around addiction is getting a little bit better realizing that it is you know a lot of people do call it a disease right um that it is an illness just like mental illness or you know, a lot of things that some people can't control. Um, so, you know, realizing that they're just people who are hurting really bad. They're just hurting. They've been through trauma and they've been through a certain situation, whatever it may be. And like you said, just it can take them like that. And so to be able to be in a situation where you can say, hey, I can help this person or hey, that can happen to anyone and they're just sick. They just need help you know, or, you know, it's, it's, it, like you said, it's a very thin line, right? And why it's so important and why the work that you're doing, it's so noble. Addiction doesn't just affect one person. You know, my godfather passed away with addiction at, you know, the age of 51, 52, far too young, but it wasn't just him that was affected. It was our whole family was affected. My mom is still devastated to this day about it. You know, I lost my godfather. Every people lost neighbors, coworkers. Mm -hmm. It affects such a huge circle of people. Yeah. And that's the sad thing is like, um, people that are in addiction, they think, okay, well, I'm not, I'm only hurting myself, right? Like this is only hurting me. Like I'm the one that's hurting. And I think that that's, you know, something that is completely, you know, unfortunately, they don't see how badly they're f hurting their friends and family as well. You know, the friends and family are constantly worrying because they could get a call any moment saying, oh, so-and-so has passed away. Um, ODs are rampant, you know, so, you know, someone picks up the wrong, wrong thing one day and boom, they're gone. So, you know, like for me, it was like, oh, well, most people don't care, right? And it was kind of this self-loathing in a way where I didn't really see how badly it actually affected my friends and family until I started to really try to make efforts to get clean. And um, yeah, like it affects so many people around you. And especially, unfortunately, when people do end up passing away, it's, I know, I'm sorry to hear about your godfather. Like it's, it happens 
way too often. And yeah, it affects, and I've seen it happen where someone ODs and then um, another family or friend will actually pick up addiction because they're hurting so bad. And it just creates another cycle. And You've been to a dark place, which I hope I never have to go to. And I'm not positioned to give this advice. So what advice would you give to somebody who's listened to this podcast and they're currently struggling with addiction? How do they find their own cycling? You know, it might not be cycling for them. It could be something else. But how do they find their own version of a passion or an outlet to help them with that recovery? Um, I would say just don't isolate yourself. Um, I think the further people in addiction distance themselves from other people, that's kind of like fuel to the flames for addiction. You know, the more some um, an addict isolates and the more that they disconnect with friends or family or any community, it just makes that addiction way worse. So I would say don't isolate, right? Like try to get social and be with other people. And I know it's hard, but uh, yeah, I think the number one thing is don't isolate and don't and just take as many opportunities and options as you can to attempt to get clean. Like for me, the traditional ways of getting clean through treatment, AA, NA, those didn't really work for me, right? So that's where cycling worked perfectly. And I think that cycling does have value and endurance sports do have value to help someone recover. But the number one thing I think is just don't isolate I think the farther people disconnect themselves from society and from community and family and friends, it's just going to make that addiction worse. Oh, I think your message is a really important one. I think this has been a brilliant open conversation, which I hope is widely shared with by listeners who have friends or family members who are suffering from addiction. Before I let you go, if somebody is looking to follow your journey or they're looking to reach out to you to share a story or look for advice, is there a place they can connect with you? Yeah. Um, you know, I try to reply to every single direct message on Instagram. Um, you know, there is that film, uh, the pedal to freedom documentary that we did, um, you know, throughout 2024, we're, I'm going to try to do more in the, um, addiction and recovery space, as well as, you know, racing. Like I have a pretty, hopefully a thick race schedule. I've got some sponsors on board. That's going to try to help with that. And, um, so, yeah, you can just hit me up through Instagram and, you know, I'm happy to help. And I've been really, really gracious to actually get a ton of messages already of people who have similar experiences or have family or friends. And I'm open to try to help as any way as I can and use my experience. Your Instagram is just Owen Vermeulen? Owen Vermeulen. Uh, so it's Owen Vermeulen 78. So it's at Owen Vermeulen 78 at in, in, on Instagram. Yeah. Owen, thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I hope it's going to help some people. Yeah, I hope so too. Talk soon. Okay, thanks so much, Anthony. Appreciate it.